So uh, this morning we're going to be talking about Komaa's work and looking after our um, elders within our community and what we can do in terms of nutrition and physical activity for them. Um, so just to begin, um, who, who currently works with Komaa um, in their mahi or in their role? Um, I I do, Kanan. Awesome, Kanan. Um, what kind of services do you provide for your Kromatua? Um, it's actually uh, one of my colleagues' uh, programs. He runs the Kromatua Koeke program. Um, I just support with it, like uh, the rest of my colleagues. Um, but the services that we provide is um, we used to do um, like the bus classes, uh, uh, and um, <clears throat> we do quite a lot of walks. Uh, hikoes with our Komato Kueke, um, and along the way um, we get them to share some of the kōrero because most of them know um, some of the kōrero, some of them they don't. Um, so it's a good opportunity for them to um, share that knowledge between them, especially for some of the Komatuas. Um, and then we also do a, a, a swimming program, a water-based recovery sort of program, um, using aqua jogging and a number of other different um, things. Um, and that's when we're done in the summer seasons. Uh, we do a few other things, um, I just can't remember them right now, sorry. <laughs> awesome, you guys provide heaps of services for your, your kaumatua and yeah, it's, it's great that they're so involved in lots of parts of your mahi and you take them out on walks and let them share what they have um, to offer as well. Because yeah, they really are gems in our communities um, and within our whanau, so yeah, the more we can keep them well engaged and um, contributing, the better it is, um, not only for them, but also our whanau and our communities too. Cool. Uh, does anyone else have any services in their uh, mahi that they deliver to kaumatua or kuia? Oh, uh, sorry, Jessica, I'll just add, um, we also do a kaumatua or kuia games as well. Um, the last one we did was um, based around traditional Māori games. Um, where we got the Kueke Komatua to um, coordinate and um, deliver some of the games as well that we, we did at the games. Choice. How did that, how was that? Was it really successful? Yeah, it was quite successful. Um, the only thing was we only had about 20 Kueke Komatua that um, participated, so but there weren't many of them. Um, but what um, knowledge they did bring to the event was really awesome. Um, and some of the games that they, they shared, um, I'd never played before, which was real cool. Cool. All right. You guys are doing awesome work. Um, choice. Yeah, I only learned today that uh, there's actually Komatua and Kueke um, conferences as well, and they get... Uh, a whole lot of them together once a year to learn something new, to share, to play, um, and to sing and do weaving, all sorts of activities for them. Uh, so, yeah, your your different providers in your mahi are probably aware of that conference, but it is happening in November in Kirikiri Roa, if um, you know anyone that would like to attend. And it's just, yeah, a, a couple of days for them to all get together and, and be awesome, be awesome at being Komatua and Kuea. So cool. Thank you for sharing, Kanan. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you all about today is, is how we can help as Kaimahi to ensuring that they're eating well um, and flourishing in, in their um, oranga um, and their movement too. So uh, most of the time we just encourage lots of the basic principles we've talked to you about previously in nutrition. You know, encouraging kai Māori kai ora, making sure they're getting lots of high quality kai in terms of nutrients, uh, watching out for some of those um, manua ora nutrients as well, so you know, just being a bit more careful with the salt and the fats, we look after their heart health. Um, the amount of energy they need actually is a little bit different to say what an, an adult needs or even you know, rangatahi or anyone like that, they are a separate group. They do have different requirements. Um, highlighting the importance of water again, uh, it because of the changes to their to their bodies and the way things work, we need to um, encourage more fluids. Um, and the connections and social and far no connections and relationships they have become really, really critical to their well-being 
sometimes even more than what we needed them when we were younger. Um, and just making sure that they, they stay sharp um, and can use their hands, can use their brain, can, can move their bodies. Um, and yeah, like that old saying, you either use it or lose it. Uh, so to touch on the kai, you, as we get older, our, our energy needs decrease. We're not as active, we're not as moving around as much, and um, we don't require as much calories or energy from our kai as we once did. Um, but where the energy levels decrease, we have a need for more nutrients. So we're talking about really high quality versus a lot of quantity. So we want more bang for our buck for every mouthful of kai that they have, we want it to be really nutrient dense. So thinking about um, you know, having lots of fruit and vegetables and also having lots of high quality protein foods, lots of lean meats, you know, chicken, fish, eggs, all of those types of things. Um, it's quite often protein foods, uh, most of the time as an adult we, we meet our protein needs per day. Um, some of us definitely exceed those if we love our uh, meats and kaimuana and, and chuck back the protein shakes and eggs. Um, but kaumatua actually struggle to meet these protein requirements and uh, definitely older Māori males are more likely to not meet them um, than, than some of their other age groups. So the importance of protein Similarly to a, a normal adult, as you know, it's used for our muscles. It's used to repair, replenish, regrow some of um, our muscles. But it also has a really important function um, in terms of creating hormones, enzymes, and antibodies within our bodies to keep us well. And you know, as you get older, keeping well is almost more important um, than anything else because you can rapidly go downhill quite quickly. Um, yeah, so there's also more risk involved if our, if our muscles start to decrease, their, their risk of falls can increase, um, they're more fragile and they take longer to recover after illnesses. Um, so when you are sick or when you are unwell with an infection or you might go to hospital or even just a cut or a scrape, um, protein is the main uh, nutrient we require to heal and it carries a lot of different amino acids and they kind of are like our building blocks of lots of our uh, skin, muscles, everything. They, they kind of make us who we are. Um, so our protein foods that are really rich in these can be really great for helping us repair and get back on track. Um, another important nutrient to consider is calcium. As we get older um, and we don't meet our calcium needs, it's actually extracted from our bones and from our teeth. So there's a condition called osteoporosis, which is really common in um, older whites, <laughs> um, Pākehā uh, elderly, but for some reason Māori and Pacifica are a little bit more protective from this disorder, but it make, makes your bones really weak. So the calcium is being pulled out because it needs to be used in other places when we're not getting it from our diet. So it's really important to have lots of calcium rich foods. Um, it'll help protect our bones, our teeth, and it also has functions within our heart health and our neuromuscular systems, um, which of course will help us stay sharper for longer, which is always great. Uh, so calcium rich foods, I'm sure you're aware of uh, any of the dairy products. You know, also making sure if they're having tin fish, you know, they have ones with um, bones in them because the bones within the canned salmon or tuna actually contain a lot of calcium too. Uh, other ways is you could use bone broth, so even boil up or um, using you know the chicken carcass in your soup to really get out the calcium and nutrients from other bones, other animal products. Um, yeah, so calcium is one that definitely as we get older we need, we need to be considering um, and, it, and it's quite hard for us to meet our requirements. So I think currently 93% uh, of our Māori 
female population um, have in, inadequate levels of calcium in their diet, which is quite significant. So it's pretty much everyone um, over the age of 50. <laughs> Uh, also vitamin D, so vitamin D we get from the sun, we can get from eggs, we can get from oily fish and also some of our organ meats like liver. Um, it's really important as well, it kind of works with calcium to protect our bone health. So when we're younger it helps build our bones and when we're older it helps protect them from with our kidneys from pulling out all the calcium within the bones. Um, and it also has a role with our muscle health. So again, you know, with our older people, we want them to have uh, a, a bit of muscle still left on them, so that if they do have a little fall or nearly hit the deck, that they've got some muscles to to protect them, to help uh, get them up off the ground again, or prevent like a big fall and uh, protect some of their joints. Yeah, um, fiber. So you know, fruit, veg, whole grain cereals, breads. Those kind of foods are really important. They help prevent constipation. They keep everything healthy in our guts. And they also have a role in lowering our blood cholesterol and helping our um, glucose, blood glucose. So, you know, for people that have uh, diabetes or have had heart issues in the past, like these are some important things to note is to make sure that you're still really onto it with your fruit and veg, your um, whole grains and also your legume intake. Um, zinc, so zinc is linked to our immune system. It's found in lots of our red meats um, and yeah, I think it kind of flies under the radar sometimes in terms of um, fighting off infections and um, yeah, but it is an important one to have. And then also with our vitamin B12 and folate. So um, these are kind of found in animal products and then also folates found in leafy green veg, um, kidney beans, and they're, I guess they become more important because we lose the ability to absorb them through our gut. So as we get older, you know, things start to degrade instead of grow. <laughs> um, and in our gut we have lots of little microvilli. So what these look like is in your digestion, system, there's little finger-like structures that stick out um, from the walls of your gut and their job is kind of to cut, catch all the nutrients that fly past in the blood um, and they act as like a surface for the, the nutrients to attach and to be absorbed um, where they need to. Um, yeah. So as we get older, some of these microvilli start to get old, they might smooth down um, and there's less ability or less places for, for the nutrients to um, attach, to be absorbed. Um, and vitamin D, I mean, sorry, vitamin B12 and folate are two of these nutrients that we might start to struggle to actually absorb. So you kind of have to eat twice as much as you normally would to make sure you're meeting your requirements. Any questions about some of these nutrient-related needs for, for our Kromatsu? Yeah, no? Awesome. Um, okay, so around fluids and why, um, we do want to encourage Kromatsu and Kuya to drink a lot. Some of them do it quite naturally, you know, they have their cups of tea for all throughout the day, lots of milk and tea and coffee and um, some even like Milo. Uh, but we do really want to encourage lots of different sources of fluid because dehydration is, um, yeah, it, it, it can become quite an issue, uh, particularly around when you're on medications that might make you less thirsty or sometimes you're on a fluid restriction. Uh, that might happen with something like you know kidney failure or um, diabetes. You have different um, mechanisms and and medications that you're taking that are going on. Um, also, our response to thirst changes as we get older. Uh, it reduces actually, so we don't we don't realize how dehydrated we're getting until 
it's happened. Um, also, without an adequate fluid intake, you know, cognitive function can start to decline as well, which is um, not necessarily ideal when you're trying to stay sharp. Um, yeah, and so practical tips for increasing our fluid intake as we get older is, you know, having small sips regularly, trying to avoid tea and coffee around meal times. So if they can leave like half an hour, even an hour, either side of the meal time, um, still ensuring that they have the fluid. But if we have a break before our meal, um, you actually won't fill up on the fluid. You will be able to have your meal and still get all the nutrients you require. And also waiting maybe half an hour to an hour after your meal to have a tea or coffee is important because some of the tannins in the tea and coffee actually inhibit our body's ability to absorb the nutrients we've just eaten from our food. So when we're wanting to increase our comatose intake of nutrients, we kind of want to have these two things separate. We still want them to have fluid, of course, throughout their day, but we want nutrients rather than tea or coffee. Um, for others, you know, soup, smoothies, um, some type of uh, formulated drink can also help, uh, particularly if they're having issues around, you know, chewing, swallowing, um, actually getting enough food in, because malnutrition is also quite high amongst our, our older people. Um, so you can you can bump up their protein intake through a smoothie or through um, a soup or some type of milk-based based beverage as well. Um, yeah, um, and, and definitely, you know, things change as people get older, you can't tolerate the same foods you once did, so sometimes using fluid-based foods can help um, make sure they're still getting everything they need. Uh, so this slide, I just wanted to highlight some of the factors that influence what people are eating and drinking, um, and it's going to be really different for everyone. You know, even classifying someone as a komatua, you know, they could, I don't even think it's been agreed on in, in research, let alone in our communities, but, um, you know, sometimes they say it's over 50, sometimes they say it's it's a lot older than that. So everyone is completely unique, and where they're at with their with their kai and fluid is also quite different. Um, some of the things, like I've noticed, and some of the things that research says is that, you know, the more socially connected we are, um, the more likely we're going to eat. Like, you're going to eat when there's people around versus if you were just by yourself at home. Um, what is their physical ability to eat or to drink or to move? Um, do they have any restrictions in place? I talked before about fluid restrictions, so some uh, medical problems may may require you to to be on a fluid restriction or vice versa need to drink a lot of fluid um, which can be a challenge either way whatever side of the point you're on um, are they living in a rural environment or are they urban um, we have done some research into this and you know people that are or comats that are based rurally are more likely to have access to some of our more traditional foods um, foods that have been grown or caught or anything versus um, some of our more urban Māori who who um, have trouble accessing some of those traditional foods unless people like drop it off or they can go to a local market where something where they could pick up something. Um, if they're working versus if they're retired, that'll influence what they're eating and drinking as well. Um, if you're working, you're going to still have a little bit of a routine, a bit of a structure um, that will dictate when you can eat and drink versus when you're retired, you know, you have um, all day to make it work for you. Um, you know, how well they're doing with their teeth. Do they still have teeth? Um, what one, is there any issues going on uh, with their dental care? Do they have difficulty swallowing, lots of things influence the way that we, we chew and uh, swallow and actually start that digestion process of our food. And it will also influence how they enjoy food. 
um, if it's painful, well then maybe they're not going to enjoy eating and you'll just see them sipping on, on a lot more drinks than, than actually consuming a pie. Um, what is their food security situation like? Is there a lot of money for them to go and get food? How do they get there? Can they access transport to you know, catch the bus to get to the supermarket? Can they walk around the supermarket or the market? Or do they have people that cook for them? Um, yeah, do they know when their next meal is and what that might look like? Um, lots of different influencing factors, and I'm sure there's many, many more that I haven't even um, touched on. You know, also a lot of older people like having foods that are familiar to them versus having new foods introduced. Not all, but but a lot of them prefer um, stuff that they, they knew when they were younger or that they really enjoy um, and often avoid like spicy or ethnically diverse foods perhaps. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have any suggestions of what other influences could affect their their intake of kai or or water or fluids? Okay, so I asked you this question at the start. It was really nice to hear. Um, some from Canaan around what services you have in your area and um, with your mahi. So, you know, I just want to throw the question out there again, like what are some of the challenges or issues that, that you see Kaumatua are facing in your communities? Does anyone have any suggestions or anything they've come up against? Um, I just saw that Marquini had said, you know, what about the times of year or the seasons um, for those influencing factors before? Like, you're totally right, that, that would definitely um, influence what they can access and eat, um, depending on when it is. Um, yeah, so... I guess some of the issues I've seen with Kuramatua, what they might face is um, lots of the stuff around, uh, I suppose, you know, sometimes on the marae they've got quite a lot of expectations on them. They might have to sit out in the pai pai for hours on end and like then if they've got a medical thing going on as well, they do need to actually take a break and go and have something to eat or like you know, standing for hours and they've got gout and that, that sort of thing. So they have a health issue as well as um, a cultural obligation at times and just how we manage that and how we make sure that we manaki them and look after them um, when they're in some of those roles. Um, and lots of access issues to, to support and, and kai as well um, is what I've seen. Um, um, yeah, yeah, just on that, Jessica. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just on that, um, we found that there, were, um, there was issues around tangi as well. Um, yeah. Like our mark when you said when it started to get colder, um, that's typically when our kaumatua will um, go to the other side, um, yeah. typically. Um, so around the colder months, um, we tend to have a drop off in our participation rate just because um, there's more tangi in that time of year for our kaumatua. And most of them are, um, like you said, have cultural obligations or marae obligations. Um, so we found that um, some of our, our kaumatua koeke, um, the attendance was, I guess, um, sporadic at times. Yeah, yeah. Um, that It's kind of uh, an awful time of year, that time of year, when it gets colder and people start to get sick. And it's usually our young, our youngest and our oldest in our communities that suffer the most. Um, yeah, and again, it's that double-edged sword of they 
have to attend like a tangi or, or something and, and it's cold and it's wet and it's miserable um, and they actually put themselves at risk as well. Um, but of course that they'd want to be there or they need to be there. Um, but yeah, so encouraging them to, to make sure they're all wrapped up and have been eating well so that they, they have the, the strength and the immune system to fight off any of those nasty bugs that can just take their toll on their mane. Um, so with that season sort of situation um, in the colder months, is there anything that you guys do to, you know, support them or look after them even more? Um, yeah, um, some uh, he tends to have a more um, hands-on approach with them around those times of months, so he tends to be uh, in communication with them a lot more. Um, yeah. So he's always ringing them to see when they're available, um, and he always does follow-ups um, later on in the week to make sure that nothing's come up during the week um, and stuff like that. So he, yeah, I guess he's just more hands-on. Um, we try to one year we try to change the activity, um, so we try to move it into an indoor pool. Um, oh. and do um, water-based stuff because um, it's inside. Um, um, the only thing with that was that um, some of our komatos, like I said, um, they didn't have the time when they weren't available, um, so that sort of dropped off our participation numbers, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, does anyone have, like, do they offer... I don't know, flu shots and stuff to any of your komata or um, anything like that around those times? Uh, we, we at Papatakaro, we, we don't necessarily um, go out of our way to offer it, um, yeah. but I'm sure there are times where we do um, suggest that they do get that yeah, um, yeah. as a way to, I guess, yeah, prevent them from getting it. Yeah, awesome. And you guys do lots of cool mahi there. Um, yeah, of course, Adini had also posted a comment saying, you know, they can have mobility issues um, when the body doesn't want to move or work as it used to, um, which is totally true. And, and um, yeah, you can <laughs> you can see that in the way they move. And and um, again, with the colder months, you know. Things tend to stiffen up and ache a little bit more sometimes too, um, with you know things like arthritis and whatnot. Um, so coming to, on to movement now, you know we we would like to encourage our komatsu and kuya to be as active as possible, um, moving and breathing, stretching. You know it's all going to help us be functional in our everyday life and activities. Um, having more muscle tone, more strength in our muscle will help our circulation as well. You know, still be able to do things like play with them or call, you know, like you were saying, go out for a walk and share some of the uh, whakapapa and knowledge of the area that they hold. Um, and really just about protecting ourselves from falling, injury or even illness. Um, most of the time when you see elderly in um, a hospital, they they actually suffer from malnutrition. And they might look really big, but they've actually lost a lot of weight really rapidly. Um, and as we know, having a bit more weight on us as we get older is actually a protective factor, not only for our bone health, but also um, as kind of like that extra reserve that you might need if you do become a bit mawiwi. Um, yeah, and also moving like just for as, as it does for healthier, healthy adults, it can help improve our sleep and our appetite. Um, and I talked a bit before about how our thirst response decreases. It's the same with our appetite. It also changes. Um, it decreases. You might not get the same hunger cues as you once did um, when you were younger. Um, and we, that's, I kind of think of appetite almost like a muscle. You need to keep moving it and keep um, working it for it to um, to remind you to or to respond. I'm not sure if that made sense, but um, you know, if you you don't use your muscles, you lose them. It's the same with your appetite. Um, you need to keep giving a little bit of a workout 
keep eating small little snacks. Um, yeah, otherwise it just decreases and you don't actually feel hungry anymore. And then you'll just lose weight and that's not what we want in our older people. Um, so the idea around snack activities are breaking up our exercise into small manageable chunks. So for some, you know, they might only be able to do 10 minutes of something, but being able to do 10 minutes of something three times a day is better than um, trying to do a whole big unachievable task of an hour like we would have once recommended. I'm um, so trying to focus on what activities they enjoy. Um, I know there's lots of different Komatsu and Kuya programs that are around our country. You know, there's things like, I think it's called Kumba, it's like Komatsu or Zumba, or there's Kabahaka, or you could do any range of um, activities. I really liked that you guys get them in the pool, get them doing aqua stuff. Um, Kanan, that was, that's pretty choice. Um, there's lots of different things and I guess pulling on the resources of our communities and of what they want to, and what Komatsu and Koya want to do as well. You know, somehow create um, a social network, a little hub of activities just for them um, would definitely encourage them to be active and it's something we would totally support. Um, yeah, so walking, Tai Chi, even, you know, using something like a karakia and putting a movements to it, using our breath, all those kinds of thing, things um, can be really beneficial. Um, you'll see in the picture at the bottom on the left, we've got um, a kuya there using arako. Um, and we had taken them through some movements as, and breathing techniques using those as well. Um, so all sorts of different things that we can pull on. Um, using you know traditional games uh, is a great way to engage and to keep them using both sides of their brain as well as um, using all their muscles and body too. Uh, yep. Um, so we also would want to encourage them to be able to do movements that will help them in their everyday life. Um, functional movements, things like, you know, if we're telling them we want them to be healthy and well to go out and play with their mokos, then, you know, what, what kind of movements can we help them practice or strengthen to be able to do those things? Um, so one of them, you know, anything with a bend and lift movement. Um, in the gym we call it squatting, but in everyday life when you put it into practice it's you know, their ability to get in and out of a chair, um, squatting down to lift up the groceries from the floor, maybe getting out of the car. Um, so these types of movements all require strength in your, your glutes and your quads and your hamstrings, but also a little bit of stability in your core and a little bit of flexibility is needed too. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily recommend all our, <laughs> um, our comments to go and do like 20 squats or something. We'll see how much weight they can um, squat, but definitely the, the, the movements that they need um, need to engage some of those key muscle groups. Uh, so there's been a whole lot of research into, you know, what is the best types of movements for, for older people, um, for Komatsua, and um, I'm going to show you maybe six that have been used internationally um, across a, a um, a lot of people, they've used hundreds of people to create these validated tests um, and yeah, it might be interesting for you to, to give them a try with some of your Komatsu or Kuya in your, in your um, area. But so the, the 30 second chair stand is one that sort of helps with that bending, that squatting movement that we were talking about to assess whether or not they, they might be needing to improve in that or um, yeah, are at risk of, of um, not being able to get up and down and stuff. So the 30 seconds chair stand is basically just putting their hands across their chest, getting um, a chair that's not too low, um, and just getting them to, to sit down and stand up um, and in control, of course, not just <laughs> flopping down. Um, so sit down and stand up um, for 30 seconds and see how many you can you can do in that time. Um, so that's one of them. Um, 
a chair sit and reach? So this is kind of looking at our flexibility. Um, can they bend down and touch their toes while they're sitting, keeping you know your core locked in, um, making sure you have really good posture, straight back, that kind of thing, to reach down and touch their toes. So this would be important for like tying up your shoelace or perhaps bending down and picking up something that dropped onto the floor. Um, anything that sort of requires that lower body flexibility. Um, even yeah, really low cars to try and get out of as well. Um, a six minute walk, so looking at how far they can walk in six minutes. Um, this is you know, obviously looking at our aerobic endurance and, and getting our breathing, our lungs going, um, but making sure that you know, they are going to be able to walk um, around the marae, they, they'll be able to go shopping, might be able to make it around the supermarket, um, that kind of thing. Um, an up and go test, so basically this is just where we're wanting them to be able to do a quick maneuver, so getting off the bus in time, getting up to answer the phone, going to the bathroom, responding to something in a quick manner. Um, maybe they left the jug on, maybe the pot's boiling over, I'm not sure, but just from a sitting position to a walking position and back. So we're looking at agility as well as um, our balance. Um, so yeah, just if you get them to sit down and then walk out to a certain distance and back and time how long it takes to, for them to get there. Um, pushing mo movements are really important as well. So a pushing could be either pushing forward, so a really stubborn door, for example, pushing something over your head, so lifting an object onto a really high shelf, or taking something down as well, um, pushing to the side. So, you know, if you're lying on the couch watching some TV, can you actually push yourself to sit up um, or get out of bed? Um, so, one thing that you could do is get them to to assess this, is to to see how they're going with their pushing movement, so maybe holding a broom or a rako, um with two hands, either sitting or standing and seeing how they can, how they go with moving it above their head. You know, for some people the shoulder flexibility may be um, starting to deteriorate and it's just kind of, can they do those movements? How many can they do before fatigue? Um, and if they can't do that, then what, what kind of things what we need to strengthen or to work on to make sure that they can do those movements. You know, even things like hanging out the washing, it can become such an arduous task for um, Matua. So this back scratch test is again looking at our shoulder flexibility. You know, even <laughs> even some adults can't do it, or even some kids. Um, or sometimes on one side we're better at it than the other. But can you reach your arms over your shoulder? And bring the other hand up the back, and can your fingers touch when you when you meet? Um, and what we would suggest is that you just measure that distance and, and see if they um, improve over time. Maybe get them to warm up a little bit though before you do this, because most stretching tests work better once you're a little bit warm. Um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't really think about that movement until maybe we have an arm or a shoulder injury. Um, but it is kind of required for pulling on and off, you know, jerseys or jackets, even putting on our seat belts, um, doing your hair. Um, if you've got really long hair, you know, you've got to be able to hold your hands up <laughs> to plait it or to tie it up or anything like that. Um, yep, so back stretch. Um, a stepping test, so how many steps can you take in two minutes? This could be using um, just a you know, a set of stairs using a step, or if you don't have that around, you could just make a mark on the wall or a, a level that they need to lift their leg up to. And just how many they can do in two minutes, um, and just count each time that the right knee is raised off the ground. So these, uh, that was a, that one's a pretty easy one to do. So how do you know if they need to do more or less? Well, they the fancy research people um, came up with these validated risk zones. Uh, so the, the 30 second chair stand, you know, if they can't 
do more than eight, or they can't do eight stands from sitting to standing, um, we definitely need to look at what we can do to strengthen their, their um, bending, squatting movement. Um, oh, the arm curl, I didn't, I don't think I covered that one, sorry. Um, but basically that's just like, you know, doing a bicep curl um, with, with a really light weight. Again, that'll be for strengthening us to be able to pick up shopping, pick up more call, whatever. Um, the six minute walk, so if they can't do more than 320 metres, they would be classified at risk. Um, and that's, like we wouldn't think that that's that far, but you know, even the ability to walk from you know, your car into the doctors or your car into the marae or your walk around the supermarket to get what you need or whatever you might need to do. Like it's kind of, it's always going to take about six minutes or even more. Um, so yeah, it's important to slowly build up their ability to walk um, and encourage them to do that. Um, the, the sit and reach test, so for men it's slightly different. Um, we want them to have uh, 10 centimetres less than 10 centimetres, sorry, apart from their toes to their hands, um, and for women, 5 centimetres, so something to work on there. The back stretch, um, we don't want to get more than 10 for men or for women, we don't want any more than 5 centimetres. And for the agility test where you have to stand up quickly and rush to answer the phone, um, we don't want it to be any more than 9 seconds. Um, yeah. So we've done these a few times with different groups of Komatsu and Kui and they really enjoyed like getting competitive against one another um, and you know trying to sabotage each other's attempts and all sorts of things. Um, but I guess they are quite simple activities that don't require any um, gear or equipment as well, which is helpful um, just for them to see, hey, where am I at and what could I improve on? Um, because they will help improve their, you know, their quality of life and their ability to, to be engaging. Um, so yeah, I just would really encourage you to get creative with how you might get their um, their movements and them them moving and eating um, well. Um, in terms of the yeah those international tests that have been used. We were reflecting on them yesterday and thinking, well, actually, like that's really cool as a measure. If you were going to do a fitness test for an older person, they, you know, those meet all the right things, um, but they're not really, mm, I don't know, Maori or they're not really um, appropriate all of the time. So I would just really encourage you to get creative with perhaps maybe how you could help them strengthen um, some of those areas. So thinking about um, those functional things like getting in and out of a car, getting in and out of bed, being able to pick up your, your moko or pick up your shopping, tie up your shoelace, hang out the washing, like those things. Thinking about what um, muscles that they're using and what areas they might need to strengthen to make sure they can do all of that. Um, again, flexibility as well. Uh, yeah, um, lots of our traditional activities keep keep um, popping up in my mind. We use a lot of hand games as well that um, help with coordination, keeping you um, thinking as well as um, moving and reciting words at the same time. Um, if you play them fast, sometimes you even get puffed. <laughs> um, and they also help with, you know, toning up your arms and back as well. Um, even you know using our our modako as a form of of exercise um, you can do tai chi even yeah there's lots of different ways that we can engage komatsu and make sure that they're using um, their muscles staying strong staying well and also um, being socially connected which is huge um, as well for ensuring that they stay well um, yeah, does anyone else have any ideas of how you could 
get creative with Komato and get them engaged and moving? Um, yeah, what well, um, one year we did uh, line dancing as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the Komato, I love that. Eh? We do. Oh, and I'm uh, oh, sorry, we did um like a yuka, like cards, playing cards. Oh yeah. Um, like a, uh, I think it was like a Wednesday night. Um, yeah, that was another one. Perfect. Yeah, I've seen them play like yuka, bingo. Um, bridge, <laughs> all those games. Um, bowling, I don't know who still does bowling, but some people like it. Um, even having, you know, how we encourage them to still do kapahaka, and um, there's an opportunity for a komatsu or kapahaka competition, it's pretty awesome. And that kind of combines all sorts of elements. <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, so would you feel confident to create um, a, a nutrition and movement plan or goals with, with Komatsu? Yeah. What kind of um, what kind of challenges do you think you would face? Nothing. You got it sorted. <laughs> Um, okay, does anyone else have any questions? No? Sweet. Okay then, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, then, I'll leave you all to have a great day. Um, if you do have any questions about or suggestions around um, Kaumatua and Kua and how um, we could improve their their nutrition or their um, activity or movement, um, please feel free to send those through. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all next week on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, take care. Have a good day. Thank you for your involvement, um, everybody, and for Kanan for your contribution. Awesome. Sweet. Sweet. See you. See you.